Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone, dear colleagues, dear friends. It's a real pleasure to be addressing you. I apologize uh, right from the start for not being live. I'm recording this just a few hours before your event, uh, but I want to um, uh, thank especially Shoba and Bobby for having having organized this uh, uh, this webinar that allows us to sort of uh, make the point on where we stand uh, at this point in time uh, in our fight against tuberculosis and our attempt to end tuberculosis. It's a pleasure for me also because now I'm devoting a bit less time to tuberculosis than I used to, but still I am involved and uh, by uh, in a way by virtue of teaching global health, uh, I uh, often use the tuberculosis exam that to me remains again the best example in a way the best model of a response to a global burden of a disease such as this one uh, now the uh, what I want to do is uh, uh, to share a few slides that I have prepared for uh, this uh, particular uh, session and uh, I uh, uh, again I am happy to be part of it and to be part of this uh, of this uh, uh, discussion on a theme find TB, treat TB, prevent and tuberculosis, which I like very much as a as a sequence. Let me start by reminding everyone how all began. It began about 10 years ago at the time of the uh, World Health Assembly 2014, when we did not yet know what the UN Sustainable Development Goals would be. We knew that they were coming, we participated in that kind of discussion, especially on our uh, SDG number three, devoted to good health and well-being for everyone worldwide. But we had the intuition of what was going to happen. And for the previous couple of years, we actually worked towards a new strategy that would adapt to the new era of the sustainable development goals. That strategy was then endorsed and approved in a way by the World Health Assembly in uh, May, in, on the 21st of May 2014. It was later branded, a few months later, branded as the end TB strategy. We had ambitious goals. The ambitious goals were largely pushed by activism, I must say, more than countries themselves. It was the activists that pushed us in this direction of setting very ambitious targets. Some people now would like to change the target. I wouldn't, because these are still our, in a way, our mission, our vision to get there. Um, the strategy was built on three pillars, as you can see on the blue uh, columns there, and on four principles. I want to, in the occasion of this uh, webinar, I want to emphasize pillar one. As you can see there, even in this particular uh, uh, slide, integrated patient center care and prevention. Let me go to it, which is uh, very relevant for the theme chosen today. Number one, early diagnosis of TB, including universal drug susceptibility testing. So early diagnosis now in 2014, when we developed the strategy, meant essentially the use of rapid molecular technology that was that became available four years before in 2010 with the uh, uh, expert. Nowadays, we have other rapid molecular testing, and there is no doubt in my mind that universal drug susceptibility testing is an extremely important element of this. Um, we pushed it back 10 years ago when we were just at the beginning. Nowadays, there is no justification. I spoke years ago of malpractice. If someone did not do for a fatal disease like TB, drug susceptibility testing, there is no other infectious disease that is fatal that you would treat without knowing what you're treating, right? Um, and so nowadays I say that it's not just malpractice, it's a crime, not really uh, doing what needs to be done in terms of diagnosis and in terms of early diagnosis. Now, early diagnosis also means treating early and treating all kinds of TB with the proper regimen. Then we speak about activities in collaboration with other uh, um, other programs addressing comorbidities. And in point D, we speak about preventive treatment of people at high risk. So let me just remind everyone, going back to diagnosis uh, for just a few seconds, that was in December of 2010, so nearly 14 years ago, 13 plus years ago that uh, the World Health Organization endorsed the use of, in this case, was expert, the very first one that came out. And you see that it was widely covered from New York Times on top left to uh, uh, CNN, 
to the Guardian, the Times of India, the Hindu, the French uh, press, and so on and so forth. So no more excuse 14 years later not to have this kind of test available. I want to emphasize another important point that early diagnosis means early treatment and early treatment means saving lives but at the same time it means cutting transmission cutting the chain of transmission because you render the person not contagious to others in the same community and that's how tb has to be tackled if we really are serious about elimination but not only but early treatment also means proper treatment and precise use of the best regimens for all in need. So now, that having been said, let's look at what has happened in the past uh, few years. Well, uh, we have nowadays um, uh, tools that uh, were unthinkable of 10, 15 years ago, starting, as I said, with rapid molecular diagnostic, but now we have tools for treatment. So, for example, we uh, we can use a four-month regimen to treat TB that has been shown now to be non-inferior to the classical six-month regimen. You see it there. It uses, uh, 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 as you see, two HPMZ, so isoniazid, uh, rifapentin, moxifloxacin, and uh, pyrazinamine. Um, and we can use another four month regimen in certain uh, patients with uh, tuberculosis uh, that is not uh, uh, highly uh, serious and uh, and uh, where you know the the possibility to in non severe TB let's say where the possibility of uh, shortening treatment exists for drug resistant TB similarly we have now a six month fully oral regimen what is called BPALM or BPALM, which is bedaquiline, pretomanid, linezolid, and moxifloxacin. That's a major advance. It was completely unthinkable 10 years ago. We were still uh, using aminoglycosides, which are injectable drugs, and we all know what the pain and the suffering is for people affected. We also have uh, extraordinarily short treatment for TB infection, or if you like, latent TB infection, which means having what you see there at the, at the bottom on the right, having regimens of even one month duration, rifapentin and INH daily, or uh, uh, 12 weekly doses, that means three months every once a week, every week, a treatment with the same two drugs. So extraordinary, I would say, uh, progress in uh, uh, the sense of better regimen, shorter regimen. Now, the main issue here uh, to really take care of everyone and eliminate TB is how to ensure that everyone has access to these treatments besides the diagnostics. Well, uh, I want just to add that we are involved in a major trial called Unite for TB and have conducted a stakeholder analysis talking to uh, WHO national programs, all the big partners, the bilateral donors, and so on, the community, etc., to ask them what are the major impediments that you see if one day we have a new regimen or a new drug. Um, and so what we, we gather out of this is quite interesting. This is essentially the logo that is being used in this $180 million project, or euros, I should say, project. Well, these are the take-home messages. Uh, we basically um, are, are recommending now all the researchers as part of this consortium, but also others involved in clinical trials, that the collaboration with key stakeholders and communities is an added value and a key to success. That is the number one statement. The second one is on the priorities. Priorities are engagement of the World Health Organization because that can provide eventually proper uh, policy uh, guidance uh, to countries and open a constant dialogue with national TB programs and communities, often excluded from uh, uh, clinical trials that are based uh, on research institutions oftentimes. So it's time to really link this uh, parts of the system. And eventually, uh, the other important priorities that emerged out of this analysis with stakeholders is the facilitation uh, of future access to the, to the innovations, discussing as, uh, as, as soon as we can with the industry, with the producers, uh, a, a, pricing, uh, a pricing logic that uh, is favorable to, to people living in poorer countries, doing economic analysis on the novel regimens and other initiatives of this kind. All of this is targeting, as you can understand, is targeting elimination of TB. Now, 
10 years ago, when uh, the uh, NTB strategy was approved, we presented this particular graph and we, we said, oh, OK, look at the uh, red curve there, the current global trend, which is about 1.5 percent per year. Now, we were uh, hoping at the time that with the better use of everything that is available already, that was available already 10 years ago, we would make it accelerate. We would accelerate this decline from 1.5 percent per year to even 10 percent by next year, by 2025. And we were counting on a new uh, uh, series of tools, particularly a vaccine, that would then further accelerate to get us to the targets established within the end TB strategy. We um, define what was needed, better diagnostic, better treatment, vaccines, right? And we said, essentially, if we have everything available by 2025, we can really target elimination. We even had uh, uh, previously some uh, uh, some models, mathematical models that showed, uh, here is an example, they show that if we go ahead with the same type of incidence decline by 2050, which is when elimination should take place, the famous target for elimination less than one per uh, patient per one case rather of TB uh, per million people, we would be in 2050 at a thousand times a greater level than elimination itself. So we said we really need something right that is much better than what we what we had. And uh, and this was the logic behind the graphic that uh, I showed you. Now, let me tell you that disappointingly, this elimination curve, or rather the red curve here of the reality has gone even worse than that. So not only it does not decline, uh, but uh, at a higher level, but it, uh, it started increasing due to the COVID disruptions in the past uh, two, three years. Now, that having been said, we have to ask ourselves what prevents access to all of the existing and all of the new tools. I would say very simply that we have impediments, major ones, at uh, governmental level, uh, starting with the registration, starting with some countries that require to repeat trials that have been internationally uh, recognized because uh, 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 in their own country uh, uh, they need to demonstrate that uh, these uh, particular regimens or drugs also work in their own population. This delays access by years. It's not a matter of one week or two. It's a matter of years. Uh, the pricing issue uh, that has, has been recognized in our own stakeholder analysis is a major issue here, right, to provide quick access. The lack of vision in general by governments, uh, by, by people who are responsible. Then we need essentially uh, a much higher uh, engagement of the community and therefore the pressure, the healthy pressure that will come to governments if communities are mobilized. And I want to say that uh, another uh, big uh, challenge uh, that prevents access uh, uh, and quick access is poverty and lack of education and information that would allow then communities to act. So the question really is what is holding us back? And I always claimed and I keep claiming that the, uh, the, the issues here are not so much technical. Of course, there are technical issues. Eh? We would all love to have a vaccine, for example, or a regimen that you can give in one month rather than even four months, which is short enough, but not, not, not good in the end. Eh? It's still four months. So I, I claim that they are both, uh, 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 these bottlenecks are both of political and financial nature. The political indifference was already, in a way, denounced back in 2010. This is a Lancet paper. Uh, it, it basically shows that nobody really at high level, whether it was any UN agency leader, I never saw a, uh, um, a director general of WHO saying TB is my priority, for example, or the World Bank that had special programs on other diseases, not on TB, or in the UNICEF portfolio, or in the presidential initiative of the United States, or in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the pharmaceutical industry uh, itself. So political indifference is a major problem here, despite the fact that this has been quite well demonstrated uh, by, for example, the Global Fund showing this slide that says essentially by one dollar of investment, you will have a benefit of some $30 for uh, dealing with tuberculosis, case, fi case finding and treatment, much, much better than malaria, much better than expanded immunization, much better than HIV. And the uh, economist, which is if you like, a very reliable source uh, used this example that came from the Copenhagen consensus 
uh, that was judging the different targets in the um, new sustainable development goals and showing that tuberculosis, as you see there, will give you a benefit per dollar spent that is in the range of $40. Compare, compare for example, to reducing stunting and better than any other health intervention. That's the reality about tuberculosis. Um, the second point that comes directly from the lack of political commitment is this one, is the financial inadequacy. These are the latest data pod produced by, um, by the World Health Organization in the global report, showing essentially that we are half away for TB research compared to what was the target that was, by the way, uh, $2 um, billion a year, which I always consider totally inadequate, because with $2 billion, even if we just have one billion, right, we can see that. But even with two billion dollars, we would not be able to accelerate the production and the discovery of new tools. Um, just think about the, um, the amount of investment made by uh, major research agencies on, for example, HIV AIDS or on COVID. That is what allowed very rapid tools to become available. When it comes on the left here to uh, prevention, treatment, care and so on, diagnosis and care, etc., well, we are far away from the target that was established at 13 billion. Now, this, by the way, these new uh, um, estimates, these new targets have been, uh, in a way, revised and revisited, and they are now uh, doubling almost uh, these, uh, these amounts, but we are still far away because the amount uh, actually invested remains the same. So this is just to show the trend of funding for TB research, essentially a flat line, just light increase in the past in the past four or five years, with a gap that is essentially the, uh, uh, of one billion, similar to what the actual investment is. And this is the funding for care, which when you can see very clearly, is even decreasing compared to the biennium 2018 2019. The gap is now in the range of 7 billion out of the 13 desirable. So how to ensure under this condition that everyone has access? And I think we need two major high-level decisions and policies to start with. And the two major high-level health decisions are those. One is universal health coverage and the other one is social protection. Universal health coverage which is shown by the, bl the blue uh, cube down here, is what ensures that people have access without incurring catastrophic expenditure when it comes to medical costs and, uh, uh, if you like, direct medical costs or direct medical expenditures. But it's not sufficient. You need social protection. You need mechanisms that are uh, there allowing, to, uh, pe allowing people with tuberculosis to survive during the months of the long months of treatment when they live already at the poverty or extreme or absolute poverty level, right? Uh, having TB means uh, uh, essentially not having a salary, not having any, any income without social protection, no way on earth we are going to eliminate TB. And I think I have to insist on this one. When uh, I left WHO, we started a series of uh, uh, costing surveys in uh, countries, national surveys. And there are nowadays, my colleagues, they have done some 30 countries, uh, national surveys, showing what? Showing that 50 percent, half of the people or the households affected by TB get into catastrophic, uh, uh, exp uh, catastrophic cost due to the disease, let alone when you have drug resistant TB in these cases in the range of 80%, four out of five, if you like, will incur catastrophic expenditure and get, and get in a way, impoverished further. Uh, in other words, is the vicious circle of poverty inducing tuberculosis, tuberculosis inducing further poverty. And that is uh, literally unacceptable in the absence, especially when you have no universal coverage and social protection mechanism that would save lives, not just for TB, but for many other poverty related diseases. Uh, this is, for example, to show you the universal health coverage uh, um, um, the essential service coverage uh, by country and what you can see easily here, the, the countries of Africa and good part of Southeast Asia are uh, essentially countries where the coverage is uh, less than 50% of the people. And if I show you now uh, this other slide, that uh, is very, uh, uh, I would say, very uh, clear, uh, you can see what uh, what the different countries, uh, in a way, report in terms of cost to households affected by TB from the Global Report 2023. There are direct medical costs that constitutes a relatively small part because medical costs are normally 
provided by the governments. The racks are provided free of charge, but you have a large amount here in light blue of direct non-medical costs, those listed there. And importantly, you see that in most countries, the majority of costs incurred by patients are indirect costs lack, uh, um, um, due to lack of salary, lack of income. So uh, the social protection for people with TB now has to be analyzed in terms of what I, are the different mechanisms that could be put in place. And you notice here that the majority of the highest burden countries have this yellow orange type of, uh, of little rectangles, which means they have no cash transfer mechanism. They have um, um, no enabler to facilitate treatment. They have no food security. Nutrition, by the way, especially in Southeast Asia, is a major issue inducing tuberculosis. And, uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, in a way, correction of nutrition is also an element that will prevent death of people with TB. So not addressing those with social protection mechanism is again, I would call it policy malpractice. Now, how to ensure everyone has access? Once again, the same question, and I say the answer is commitment and accountability. And why do we need a multi-sectoral approach to NTB? It's not sufficient what the health system can do. Well, the health system can take care of this, can take care of the, the transition between latent infection and active disease and the uh, prevention of death and suffering. Because if you treat, you, you diagnose and treat early, then you prevent death. But that's about it. If we are thinking about elimination, OK, these are other, by the way, risk behaviors or risk factors that can be addressed within the health sector. But if you think about elimination, well, what can the health sector do for the poor living and working condition that generate crowding, poor ventilation for minors, city causes or indoor air pollution for more than half of the of the, of the world, especially women uh, subjected to toxic fuels inside the house when they cook or they warm the house. And the, all of this is conducive environment for transmission. And what can the health sector do for these other uh, elements, high level determinants like food insecurity? Undernutrition is an element that favors tuberculosis. Stigma, discrimination, marginalization of vulnerable people in, uh, basically produces vulnerabilities. You see a list of people who are particularly vulnerable. So to address this issue, we need much more from other sectors. We need other sectors of development, well represented by the UN Sustainable Development Goals, to uh, uh, reach the same at the same level the targets that has been uh, that have been uh, uh, produced within health. So you see over there the uh, poverty uh, uh, agenda. You see the uh, clean energy agenda. You see the nutrition agenda, the gender equality, and so on and so forth. That's why we need a multi-sectoral approach. And I would say that uh, this is the Western Pacific region. The Southeast Asia region has done exactly the same. We, uh, I participated also in this kind of discussion. I think the fight against TB has to be played at three levels, three layers. The TB specific one, that's the responsibility of all of us working on tuberculosis, especially of the national TB program, uh, addressing case finding, addressing a lack of prevention, uh, quality of drugs, drug resistance, and so on. But then you have a blue layer, which is the health system in general around around uh, those who work on tuberculosis. And that means uh, um, universal health coverage. That means insufficient coordination to address risk factors and so on and so forth. And you need an extra layer, which is the one shown in green there, which is health beyond health. In other words, what needs to be done in other sectors to then uh, facilitate the fight against tuberculosis in this case, but also against many other diseases. And so here you have the uh, multi-sectoral approach approach that uh, I have shown you in the previous slide where I was, uh, I was listing all the SDGs that are essential. I wrote this article now back uh, four years, five years ago, no accountability, no results, and the difficult task of advocating for tuberculosis solutions. Now, the accountability issue has been taken at very high level. WHO developed this excellent multi-sector accountability framework to allow people to understand how you build accountability by everyone 
not just by the health sector or the national program, but the other sectors that have a role, like fighting, uh, as a, again, fighting malnutrition and undernutrition in particular, fighting uh, poverty, uh, fighting for no more indoor air pollution, etc., etc. So we went from the Moscow meeting in 2017. Then my colleagues went on to the 2018, here you go, uh, first uh, UN General Assembly on tuberculosis, building that the elements for this uh, fight against TB. Um, the latest of this uh, big political event was in September uh, last year, 2023, at the UN General Assembly, second meeting, that came up with a new set of targets. Not that the previous targets were ever reached, apart from preventive treatment among people living with HIV, but at least uh, uh, there is an attempt to, to go towards it. No, uh, you know, COVID was uh, obviously a major impediment, a disruption, but even before COVID, we saw no sign of acceleration. Much more needs to be done, as you can see, besides uh, 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 having the aspiration of 22 billion uh, by 2027 spent on uh, services and uh, 5 billion, which I consider not adequate enough, not sufficient enough. Anyway, uh, 5 billion for research. We need much more than that. We published a paper just a couple of months ago in the Gray Journal talking about more is needed to end tuberculosis. Only establishment, we say, of the highest possible level commitment and accountability can end tuberculosis. Take the example of what has happened with COVID, what has happened with HIV AIDS back 25 years ago or so. So investment that are 10, 20, 30, 100 times perhaps bigger than those on tuberculosis are the ones that have ensured uh, the availability of tools and the availability and the possibility, therefore, to tackle the disease uh, in that in, in question in a much more powerful way. With that, I thank you very much, CNS. I thank all the other partners there uh, listed here, the TB people, those in the in the field, in the on the front line that fight against tuberculosis. It's your activism that uh, will then uh, determine the future of the fight against tuberculosis. Just fight back. When governments do not respond, fight back. Governments uh, listen to uh, people who eventually vote. So that is your power and that is where you need to really go uh, uh, in terms of uh, the fight against tuberculosis. Just fight back and make sure that uh, that the motivation remains to continue our fight against TB. With that, I really thank you very much for listening, and I wish you all the best uh, for this uh, for this webinar for this event that puts together communities and people affected by tuberculosis as well as experts. Thank you. Thank you so much.